So uh, first things I'm going to say is like donkeys, man. They, you know, you got to be be ready for them because they're evil and they're going to get you. So, you know, they kill more people every year than airplane crashes. Seriously, donkeys. All right, all right. So one of the things you, you'll find, I mean, Scott found this out after a while. That, you know, I really, I really don't take myself very seriously at all. Um, I'm still absolutely amazed that people actually pay me to do some of the stuff that I do because frankly I do it for free um, and, and did kind of when I was a kid so that's kind of like how I really got into all this. Um, you know that said you know I think that um, you know today we're going to talk a little bit about you know information security specifically about how some of the physical security you might see around your buildings and your facilities when you uh, get into the workplace can affect uh, information security, uh, especially some of your computer systems and uh, what all uh, you know, you'll be trying to protect, especially with you know, whether it's firewalls or you know, anything that uh, you know, donkeys will kill you if they ever get the chance. Uh, anything that it is that you're trying to protect data-wise, um, you have to remember that you know, we tend to think of information uh, and the way that you're trying to protect it and the tools you may be using to try to protect it as being virtual. All right? But in fact, they aren't. They exist by, electri by electricity. They are actual settings within a computer where there are a bunch of ones and zeros. It's still physical, which means when you try to penetrate in a physical way, God dang it, I'm getting a yawn already. Okay, so move on. All right, nobody wants to hear that. Wait, back, forward. All right. Um, wow, who is bio is this, man? <laughs> Jeez. You know? God. <laughs> well, all right, anyway. Um, but yes, uh, physical security definitely plays into it. It's not the only thing, obviously, but it's something you have to consider. All right, you've got to consider all avenues of attack because, frankly, if somebody gets access to your system physically, you're in trouble. If somebody can drop devices behind your firewall, you can be in trouble depending upon whether or not you have lots of layers of defense. When we talk about how I would go about penetrating a system physically, it's about the same way electronically. You can see sort of the same kinds of ideas and theories playing in, and that is protect to the best of your ability, but still allow what? Access. Why? Because data and, and the information that a company, a corporation, an organization, uh, anonymous, I don't care who you are, has value, all right? And Snowden collected what he had because it had that value to him, you know? Information has value. If you don't allow access to information, does it still have value? Not if, you, not if there's no access. You know, so you can very quickly just totally diminish the value of a corporation's data uh, assets, which to me I think is really kind of cool, actually. You, know, you could hold them hostage if you wanted to. Might not last very long, might not have a job very long. Probably could kiss your career goodbye, but Anonymous would love to get a hold of you. Uh, either way, um, it, uh, it has value because you can access it. All right? Of course, it also has a detrimental effect and a liability effect if you allow too much access to it. So there's that critical balance. The problem here, your conundrum, right, is that if you allow access to something, it means what? Somebody like me is going to be able to get into it eventually, all right? Even one of the most secure systems in the world, nuclear submarine, you never really hear about them sinking except for the Thrasher, which, you know, was, or the Thruster, rather, probably became the Thrasher as it went down. Um, if given enough time, will sink on its own. Why? Human perspiration. As you breathe, you perspire, you introduce water. Water gets into everything. People and everything can get into anything provided there's access. If you go and you take the data and you bury it in concrete under 50,000 you know, pounds or tons or whatever of concrete, uh, maybe it'll be millions of years before some sort of alien paleontologist comes across it and finds it and get, gets it, but eventually somebody gets a hold of it. Of course, you know, if you bury it under that much, there's you know, no use to it anymore, and it loses its data, or, or, or rather its, uh, its value. So, uh, yeah, I'm Chief Mucky Muck of the Woozy Lots. I have 20-something years of blah, all right, uh, in IT. Uh, 17 years of those were in InfoSec Cool, uh, because I really enjoyed what I got into then. My first three years of blah were absolutely terrible. I was a system administrator, and I was horrible because I had a tendency of taking it down all the time. Uh, on my own, just to see if I could bring it back up. Sorry, I'm, I'm the guy who, if you put a button in front of me, it's only a matter of time before I end up pushing it out of total curiosity. Not very good for a system admin. 
uh, really great for a guy who wants to pen test and find out how things work. Uh, I was born underneath a rock. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where. They told me it was somewhere in Mesa. But, uh, uh, and I have fun with intrusion testing, incident response, and forensics. Uh, that's been a large part of my background. Uh, they kind of all fit together. I've also been manager of um, various different information security programs. I've helped build information security departments, policies, which are really incredibly boring, but very, very necessary. <coughs> very boring, though. Uh, and risk assessment, mitigation, and management. I really got into risk assessment um, and, and this part because actually it reminded me a lot of Dungeons and Dragons because you're dealing with all these kinds of rules and you're interpreting them to the best effect. <laughs> uh, and sometimes to your best benefit. Um, it works really good too with um, uh, when you get into compliance. And some of you may go into compliance programs. Uh, compliance programs can be uh, actually a lot of fun. Um, it's kind of like getting around stuff the same way it is with security. I'm not meaning that in a bad sense, but when you come into risk assessment and mitigation, uh, one of the things you'll have to remember um, is that you know, you're gonna be working with executives and executives are gonna have to understand what it is that you're saying to them. And they speak in a complete different language. I, I'm serious, it's actually a different language. I mean, I've, I've heard it spoken before. Um, it sounds a little bit like a cross between Elvish and Orcish, which is really bizarre. But um, it, it, is, it is really weird, even weirder than French. I don't know if anybody here speaks French, but um, I don't. Uh, my credentials, if I have to show you, I have a CISSP. Um, <laughs> I have a BA in US history, go figure, and an MA in US foreign policy, because at one point in time, I thought I'd do what Scott does, but I would teach students about history. Um, and then I realized that nobody was really actually that interested anyway. Uh, so I decided I'd start hacking. No, I'm kidding. I, I kind of started that when I was a kid, and uh, I started breaking into places for fun. I was going to tell you what they were, but now that I'm on, you know, being on film, uh, I'm not, not going to say because someone could probably get me into trouble. But needless to say, I never did it to take anything. I never stole anything. I never vandalized anything. And I also was very careful not to actually break anything. So I say I broke into places. I meant I, you know, intruded them. I trespassed. That was my crime. I was a trespasser. I was a serial trespasser. Uh, I was fortunate enough not to get caught. Um, came close a few times, um, but, uh, but I didn't. And, uh, and now I've found a way that I can do some of those, use some of those skills uh, for good. I had a lot of friends also who were um, much better than I were, uh, or was at, uh, at hacking. Um, and you know, we started basically kind of like all the geeks in, at my age did. A new video game would come out, and the first thing we'd try to do is bust what we thought was encryption. It was really just page 64 encoded, you know. But we thought we were all bad, you know, so that, that way we could copy it and give it to all of our friends, you know. Um, and, uh, and we also started to by dialing up, you know, BBSs and seeing what we could post on those. And those really had no, you know, security in place whatsoever, as long as you knew the number to dial in. Uh, great fun. Uh, and then we started kind of mixing that up a little bit uh, with, you know, physical penetration. And, uh, boy, that sounds bad, physical penetration. Physical intrusion. Uh, and, and seeing what all we could do with it. Um, so really, uh, whenever you're, um, you know, dealing with an intrusion, as you will eventually, and statistically speaking, no matter what organization you go to work for, you will experience an intrusion, all right? Probably once every three years, uh, at least as probability goes. Uh, the thing is, don't panic, you know, like that poor person is. Look at them, you know, screaming. It's a bunch of baboons. I mean, I don't know why they're screaming, really. I mean, they're just baboons. I mean, I guess they could rip your face off, but, you know, I don't know. They, they look like more like they're, you know, wanting to get into the shelter and wear their clothes and eat their food. You know, but what you really want to do is you want to find, oh, yeah, remember donkeys, they will eat you alive if they ever get the chance. Uh, you want to find the real threat. You know, um, th this scares the hell out of me. Scott remembers this picture. We used this one time in a presentation because we just died laughing when we saw it. Because what we have here, well, it's a chimp in a pink sweater, bizarre. But it has this Glock, you know, and, you know, we will assume it's loaded. You know, does the chimp know what it's doing with the Glock? No, and that makes it even more scary because it may just pull the trigger for no reason at all. Uh, and then we could be in some trouble. So, you know, always assess the situation. 
the first thing that's going to happen whenever you have an intrusion that takes place is that there's going to be all these different leading theories and everybody's going to be worried about what they got to. And I'm going to guarantee you right now, 70% of those are just going to be complete and utter gibberish and people just going off the deep end. You know, the best thing to do is stay calm, get everybody together, and start knocking out various different scenarios until you get down to it and use whatever tools you have in place. Hopefully you have a lot of monitoring you put in place because monitoring is going to help you do what? Well, does it stop anybody? No, but it lets you trace, lets you track, it allows you to see what's happened, where it's happened, uh, where it's going on next so that you can start to come up with a plan to contain and also come up with a plan to find out maybe who they are. And if you're lucky, turn that information over to law enforcement and somebody can get busted, though that's rare. Um, you also uh, want to uh, determine what your best means is dealing with this particular threat. This guy's pretty scary. I don't think he's as scary as the pink, you know, sweatered one, because he actually looks like he's got intent and he knows what he's doing. Um, so, uh, but nonetheless, I think that uh, once you've discovered your threat and you've actually discovered the actor and you know what their intentions are, you're well on your way in incident response. And the next best thing I can tell you to do is to have a plan. Uh, definitely have plans in place because organizations that don't have them and they suffer an intrusion uh, are going to suffer all the worse. And not just have a plan because I've seen many, many different intrusion uh, response plans, incident response plans. And if you went around and asked anybody who's named in there with a particular role what their role was, they couldn't tell you because they've actually never even read it. You know, it was just a plan on paper. Somebody thought, hey, this sounds really good. This is great. Okay, we've got a plan. It was good for compliance. You know, check the box. But when it came down to be able to execute the plan, nobody had any idea. Management didn't know what the hell they were supposed to do. And it was absolute circus. And monkeys were running around with guns. And baboons were, you know, invading people's cars. Then execute your plan. Hopefully, you don't have to set off a, you know, nuclear bomb on your network. <laughs> But uh, if it comes down to it, you may need to shut things down um, in order to catch the perpetrator. Um, but regardless, when you execute your plan, execute it with purpose. Execute it with the backing of management. It sounds like it's going to be a pain in the butt. It will. It will be, especially if you're not speaking the same language as management. Um, but nonetheless, uh, have your plan, have your process in place, and also be ready because after you go through an intrusion, uh, chances are it'll be a great time for you to go through and start getting funding to fix holes if you still have a job. Uh, if you're somebody up at my level, you probably still don't have a job, so you're probably gone, which is great because then you can move into my level or, you know, oops, wrong way. Or you can let all your teammates take the blame, um, you know, if, if it doesn't go too well, you know. I like to call this teamwork. All those guys tried to get to the cheese at the same time. I all fell for the same trap. Or you can totally bask in the glory of your coolness. You know, uh, I like Zip. Zip's a cool guy. You know, he's he's got a plan. He doesn't panic. He knows what's going on. You know, uh, you'll come up with ideas. Uh, some of them are going to be good. Some of them are going to be bad. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, uh, watch out for donkeys. Uh, you can also become a consultant and advise management. All right, that's another career path that you may end up taking, uh, especially if you, after you've had some experience. Um, becoming a consultant and advising management is great because you can get laughed at a lot or you can laugh at them, depending upon which way you decide that this picture goes. Uh, consultants are going to, you know, management's going to ask you a lot of questions. I like to call them the little picture over on the side uh, because it always seems like they never do do whatever it is that you tell them. But you'll get all the questions like, why do I need a password? Why must I lock my computer? <laughs> why lock interior doors? But the exterior ones are locked. Why do we lock the interior ones? I'll show you here in a little bit. Uh, why must I protect my password? <laughs> why must we always update and reboot our computers? I love this one. I actually took that picture. You know? <laughs> 66 of 102. That was like five hours later. I was really, really depressed. Because I, I wanted to leave. Uh, and why do we need to, ba to badge visitors? Um, and uh, why do we have to do these intrusion tests? This is very important. One of the best things you can do uh, is to make certain that your organization goes through an intrusion test. Because you much rather go through that and have somebody on your side show you where these particular holes are 
than to find out from a criminal who comes in and breaks in uh, and takes advantage. You can use scare tactics. <laughs> uh, they don't tend to work because what we think is really scary and the way that we tend to you know, talk about it uh, to management, they don't typically understand. Uh, we can say we gotta protect ourselves from this guy. You know, whether he's you know, the virtual version of this coming in uh, and, and scaring us to death or he's you know, a physical guy. He does look really scary. Um, we can tell him we don't want to become zombies and part of somebody else's experiment to hack into someone else. Um, I did say I electrocuted monkeys, didn't I? Um, or we can say we got to protect ourselves from this guy who might disguise himself and get into our data center and act like he's on a phone uh, using a fake ID badge right here, um, which I have over here. But uh, it's amazing. People, as long as they see something, they like tend to think that you've been badged. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Or, you know, they might have a false sense of security from the security they have in place. I kid you not, <laughs> this exists, <laughs> you know. Um, it, it just, you know, one of the things you have to be aware of, well, you're, whether you're talking physical security or you're talking uh, electrical, uh, electronic security or digital security, InfoSec in general, if you put a control in place, make sure it's effective. You know, one of the ways you do that, penetration testing. Have somebody else check it, double check it. Uh, because doing something like this, just, you know, it's a waste of money. It's a waste of effort, obviously. But, you know, you're always going to be faced with management uh, not necessarily hearing you correctly, either because they don't want to. These guys who tend to call this an Internet hole rather than an RJ45, network jack, whatever. Um, the fact is you have to be able to speak their language. How do you do that? You know? Um, oh, yeah, watch out for these guys. Uh, the way that you do it is you need to assess the risk in a way that is relevant to the business, all right? Uh, and the manner in which you can do that is to sit down and say, okay, um, if, some, if, if A happens because of B vulnerability, uh, what is the business outcome, all right? And that's one of the ways that a executive is going to understand what you have to say to them. Right, they're going to understand what the impact is. At the end of the day, if you go and you talk to the CEO, do you think he's going to care how many attacks were blocked by the firewall? Or, or do you think he should care about how many attacks were blocked by the firewall? Chances are no. What he cares about is, are we doing enough? He wants to hear, are we doing enough to secure ourselves? Can I go before the board of directors and tell them we're doing what we ought to do? Keep in mind, that the CEO and the CFO do not want to build a $5,000 fence to protect a 50 cent donkey, all right? Not knowing, of course, that donkeys are dangerous, but anyway, say you had a 50 cent donkey. Well, what kind of security do you want to put around a 50 cent donkey? Probably nothing. But what if his intention was to grow the 50 cent donkey, all right? And he wants to get hundreds of 50 cent donkeys. That's an investment that should be protected. The idea becomes, well, how much should we do? Should we do what's equal to it? No, unless there's like international laws that will, you know, make you go to jail, give you the death penalty if anything happens to the donkeys. That would be compliance entering into the whole, you know, equation. But in the end, he needs to feel like enough has been done, and it's his decision. It's the CFO, CEO's decision, under your advisement. So the best that you can do is make sure that you're telling them something that they understand so they can make the best, most informed decision possible in what needs to be done. And you will be their advisor in doing that. All right. Um, enough with the boring stuff. Uh, let's get a little bit into the art of some intrusion. All right. You know, what, 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 how do you get to the point that you've got a donkey at your door like that? It's just spooky. All right, so how could you help prevent it? Well, you could do this. I think this is clever. Get a 404 error, building's not found. If I show up this and here's the building I'm supposed to get in, it's just not there, that's pretty secure. <laughs> I'm not gonna get in there. Um, you could create you know, interesting little puzzles on how to get in. Um, you know, it's funny, you know, because I think I'm like smart. It actually took me a while to figure this one out, that the nine was actually a six just flipped upside down. <laughs> you know, I was, <laughs> I was like, boy, I feel kind of stupid, you know. 
But the point is, actually, for this slide, is that sometimes it's not obvious, all right? Another good reason why you want to do intrusion testing, the way that you get in sometimes isn't obvious. Sometimes it's not even obvious to me. I have to look at it for a while if I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to do it and go, oh, wow, <laughs> look at this, you know, uh, which is another good reason to have it. And it's also another reason why you always want to make certain that you have a good layer of controls, defensive controls in place. And what are they? Well, you might think, okay, a good defensive control means access. We're not going to let you have access, all right? Well, yeah, that's good. But there's other controls, too, that augment that, like monitoring, detection, you know? Give yourself time. Um, deny the perpetrator, whether they're digitally perpetrating or physically, uh, the ability to have time to do anything. Deny them space. Deny them access and ability to work on things. For instance, don't let them get in to that unimportant computer. You're like, oh, it's a workstation. We don't care about that. We care about our servers. <laughs> well, the workstation is what they're going to compromise, so they've got time to figure out and enumerate everything they need to in order to get into the server. The same is true with, you know, physical, all right? If, if I'm getting in, the last thing you want me to do is to give me any space whatsoever that I've got all the time I want to figure out how to defeat a control and defeat the rest of the security that's in the place, a place to work from, a base internally. That's why layered security is incredibly important. You can hire a killer bear, you know. Uh, they'd probably do a pretty good job of stopping me. I don't want to be eaten. You can hire Jedi Knights or donkeys. But nothing is really going to secure you. Um, so you might as well accept it and find out where you're weak, all right? The fact of the matter is, if you let human beings anywhere near, and this is not, you know, to down us at all, uh, but if you let it human beings anywhere near a system, whether it's a building, whether it's electronics, whether it's mechanical, you've just introduced trouble. The problem here is that all of those things were made for human beings. Technology doesn't exist because of, you know, anything other than the fact that human beings were going to use it until, of course, we get into the matrix. And if, in fact, we are in the matrix, then we're all just, you know, pickles in a jar getting ready to be flushed as soon as we find out. So we really don't need to worry about it. But the end result is that um, the fact that technology is used by humans means that we have to let humans have access to it, which means we have to accept the fact that they're going to be vulnerable. And they will be vulnerable. But there's ways to change that, too. By the way, it's also humans that are going to break in. So uh, you've been patient, so I'll tell you some stories now. Uh, if you've got any questions, just remember I have no idea, so I'm just going to tell you it's because of aliens. Actually, um, I'll be around afterwards so you can ask all the questions you want to then. Um, so some of the tools you need. Disguises are good, you know. Um, actually, I've never really used any of these. <laughs> that was just a Halloween costume where I decided I was going to go as Magnum P.I., but I have used disguises before um, to great effect. Uh, there's also social engineering tools uh, that you can use. So, you know, in this particular case, it's a con, right? Try to get somebody to believe that you're this when in actuality you're this. That happens a lot online. They call it catfishing and other kinds of things. But uh, in real life, uh, if you're trying to get in, you're trying to get the confidence of the individual uh, that is the control point and let them in. So who do you think is probably, besides maybe having like armed security guards, who's probably the first control point in any facility that you walk into? It's the receptionist, right? Who typically, and this is not an affront to receptionists, who typically is some of the lowest paid individuals <laughs> in the building? Receptionists. And what are receptionists really there to do? Help you, right? They're here to try to help out you know, greet people that come in, direct them. And that's usually the kind of training they get. They really don't get much security training. You're lucky if somebody actually gave them a panic button. In that particular case, that's pretty cool, but most cases, they don't. Uh, they likely have keys to different places because they're usually the first people to what? Get into the office because they have to open it, or they're some of the first people to leave at night, and they have to lock doors. So almost always, they have keys, right? Uh, by the way, this is no different, so you'll be able to draw some parallels here to the uh, digital world and digital uh, intrusion testing, because in this particular case, um, it just so happens that um, uh, executive assistants, administrative assistants, or secretaries 
have exactly the same kinds of goodies on their workstation and in their particular area, and that's a great computer to go after if you want to compromise something so, uh, and get really good information going out. So uh, you also have to remember, too, I might as well cover this now, um, you know, information's valuable to a corporation. Information's also valuable to the cyber criminal. The only reason they're getting into you isn't because of me. They just enjoy doing it. Not anymore. It's because they are going to try to sell the information that they get on the black market. All right. Anybody know how much a credit card goes for these days? Ten cents, twenty-five cents. Yeah. It depends. Uh, it depends upon the card. Uh, it depends upon how fresh it is. Um, and uh, that's why they tend to get like huge batches of them and that's what they want to sell off. And the reason being is because they have a very limited shelf life. A, if anybody found out that they were compromised, which typically they are because the smash and grab technique that most of the, well, I can't call them hackers, the cyber criminals are using, uh, sets off too many alarms and the organization ends up knowing they were compromised, X number of cards were compromised, and so they start going through the process of informing those people and shutting those cards down. So the longer it takes for them to get those cards offloaded on the black market, the less likely they're going to be able to be used. And if they do use them, they're only good for a few transactions before the fraud alarms are raised and they can't be used anymore because they get shut down. How about a medical record? few hundred bucks, probably. Depends upon the age. They like you to be really old or very, very young. The reason very, very young is if they get your social security number, you're not going to find out that you're a victim of identity theft until you apply for a college loan. And then you're going to have a hard time. Uh, if you're really old, they're going to use it so that they can go off and start buying stuff offline uh, so that they can end up charging fraudulently to insurance companies, such as, you know, you know, I don't know, from Liberator, the you know catheter tubes or whatever. Uh, and then they sell that stuff on the black market, and that's how they end up making their money. Uh, so when they get these big batches of you know information, medical information, full electronic health records, uh, they make a bunch of money. Now, it's interesting because I say cyber criminals. The cyber criminals that go and get this stuff are using software that developed by guys like you. Um, you know, hopefully not like you exactly, but individuals who understand what they're actually doing. They're no longer the ones really doing the hacking unless they're with Anonymous or they're a hacktivist group, which is a whole different party over to the side. What they're doing is they're, they're using this software that they will subscribe to uh, along with whatever exploits have been written, you know, supplied as updates. It's a whole software market. And they will then use that to do the penetration testing, or penetrate, not testing, this, the actual uh, penetration intrusion attacks. Uh, and once those are successful and they get the data, they then turn that over to an escrow agent. Yes, there are escrow <laughs> agents on this, on this black market. The escrow agent then examines this to make sure that, the, that it's real, it's good, it's, it's actual data. Uh, they then look for the people who are going to buy it to make sure that their funds are available and that they're good, and then they allow the transaction to happen, and then they take a little bit off the top. So, you know, if you don't get a good job, you know, doing any of this other stuff, you can always go for that because there's a lot of different jobs available to you on the black market. Scott was doing it for a while, but I turned him around. Um, probably. Um, they, uh, you know, because you got to figure what your actual risk is, right? You know, you're just dealing with the specific good. Um, but, yeah, it's all about trust, right? You can't have business without trust. You know, and uh, that, uh, that way they keep that market alive and going. I always felt like if we wanted to seriously affect the black market, uh, especially around stolen information, stolen data, you should be going after the escrow agents because if there's no faith or, or any trust left in the market, you'll actually destroy the process by which it gets sold, which means nobody's going to go after the risk of actually getting the information if they can't actually sell it. All right, so some of the disguises and roles that I played, because it's really playing a role. I was an electrician. I posed as a customer once, a new employee a few times, a very stinky repairman. That was probably the most unfair thing I ever did. I felt so bad. Uh, it was for a bank. Um, and I came in, and you know, I went to one of those gag stores, you know, literally <laughs> gag, you know. And it was a bottle of this, like, horrible smelling stuff, you know. Uh, this whole gag thing, you're supposed to sprinkle it on something. So anyway, I, I, sp I put the whole bottle on myself. It was hard for me to even not tear up at my own smell. You know? And I walked in and kept myself very close to the person that I wanted to trick and let me in. 
And they just, you know, they were trying to be so polite. <laughs> I kept on saying, hey, I'm really sorry. I had this drain trap, like, explode on me, but I got to get back there to fix this thing. And, you know, eventually they, they collapsed and let me in. They literally, like, collapsed. Um, I also play the part of a physician. I'm going to tell you about some of these here very shortly. Uh, the physician was a fun one. That was five hours in a very large regional medical facility. Not here, but I can't tell you where. Uh, I don't have pictures for some of these because I had to destroy them um, out of legal obligation. Um, and there was another one where I just played some dude off of the street. Um, these tend to work, and sometimes they're not even necessary. Sometimes you can just walk right on in, you know, walk with a purpose, uh, walk with your phone. This is my favorite one. If ever somebody's around and I want to get into the door, I just put the phone up to my ear like this. Make sure you, like, have it turned off. Because if it buzzes or it rings while you have it like this, you're blown. You, 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 you lose, you know. But you, you put it up here, and then you, you hang out by the door. And you keep acting like you're going to go to the door, and you get in this really engaged conversation with yourself. The role players will have an easy job of this. And, and then you wait for somebody to come along. And when they come along and they beep in, because usually the reader's over here. They don't always put their hand on the door. You just have your hand on the door. They beep in. You open the door for them. Right? And you still stay engaged on your phone because most people will not interrupt somebody who's on the phone, especially if they're in a very engaged conversation, right? And then you just turn around and follow them on in, like you were supposed to do it the whole time. Because they're going to look at you thank you, and you're, gonna say, you're welcome, and you just follow them on in. Stay on your phone in case there's another door there, by the way, uh, that you want to get through. Because if you hold the door open for them, what are they likely to do? Hold it open for you. You'll be surprised how many times that actually works. And you just got past two layers of security, first and second. You know? Boom, boom. Just like that. Um, and it's usually that easy, all right? No, no need for any disguises or anything. Um, I usually go for the disguise because it's a little bit more fun, you know? Because uh, I feel bad after you get in like that, so I'll walk back out and go, okay, we got in that way, so we'll put that one down in the notes and put that in there and say, hey, you're going to have to train your people. Uh, and then we go for a disguise. By the way, Whenever we do these things, uh, the company and I and my group, uh, we always make it abundantly clear that this is always a management problem. Because it is. It's almost always, um, you know, since we're going after humans, it's almost always training, right? They haven't been given enough awareness. They haven't been given enough assurance, right? The assurance is important because if they know, like not everybody wants to go up and confront someone. I know some of us do because we're just that way, you know. And, you know, we'd go beat up a killer donkey if we're given the chance. But not everybody is. You know, some people don't want to confront other people. They don't feel comfortable doing so. They don't want to go up and say, hey, you're not supposed to be here. You don't have a badge. Or if they say me doing this, right, like I've just come back from lunch, they don't say, well, I, I need to see your ID badge, right, because they feel like they'd be, well, and ask for asking, right? But they ought to. So what should they do? Well, they've never seen me before. I'm kind of suspicious. They didn't see my badge. What could they do? They could anonymously get a hold of security or somebody who would be able to take action, who wouldn't mind doing that. And if they're given the ability to do that and they know exactly how to do it, they'll do it. They absolutely will. But if they don't know about it, they won't, obviously. How could they? But anyway. All right. So tools. These are fun. Okay. There's all kinds of tools, and then there's the ones that aren't on here because you kind of make them up as you go. In fact, um, you've got a lab here that could probably help me out because I broke one of mine when I was doing this. Was I doing it last? Yeah, well, I did. I did a place last week, um, and that's where I broke it. It was, it was another bank, <laughs> but I'll show you it. All right, so these are bump keys. Uh, afterwards, you want to come up. You can look at any of these. I should have brought some locks. I didn't, but we'll find some. I'm sure. Uh, these are bump keys. They're called a 999. You can buy these from, you know, any place. You go to Home Depot. It's a little dubious when you ask them for a 999, so you might want to act like you're a key guy or something. Or, yeah, you want it for your house. But a 999 is almost like a blank key, but it has ridges across the top at each point that each one of these would probably intersect with a tumbler, okay? And the idea is, is that you put it in almost, this is the secret, almost all the way but not quite you know so you put it all the way and then you pull it out slightly and then you tap it with this and turn it at the same time what happens well the force of the tap is being transferred up 
to all the pins above the shear line of a lock. And they're just there temporarily, which is why you're turning it at the same time. You kind of get to get the timing down right, but it'll turn the whole lock, it'll open up, and you're in. All right? It's pretty fast, actually. Another way to get around that, if you're not very good with the timing, is one of these. You put, a, there's a little piece that goes on here. You stick this into the lock. It's called a snapper. Snapping and putting is putting all of this different force onto the pins, allowing you to turn the lock and open up. This will get you in about 85% of the locks that are out there. Uh, it just takes a little bit of work on the timing and knowing exactly where to put it. Failing that, you have regular traditional picks, which I have here. So if those don't work because it's a better lock, you can use these picks. All right. Be careful if you show up at some places with this. And if you ever travel, like I do a lot, take this out of your bag and put it in its own separate dish for the TSA because they go berserk when they see this in a bag. You know. <laughs> I've spent some time in the office trying to explain to them, no, this isn't a gun. I'm like, can you figure, I don't know, it doesn't even look like, it doesn't shoot anything. Uh, but these you have to be careful with as well, because in some states, uh, it's like a crime just to have these, all right? Uh, so you need to be licensed, and in some states you can have them, but if you're standing next to a lock that you don't have a key for, or you're not with somebody who has a key for it, you can be busted because that they consider that to be intent, you know. So uh, it's really weird, but you got to be careful with them. California is that way. So whenever I do California, oh, just throw that out. This is my drugs. No, I'm kidding. Uh, by the way, these are good for getting out of handcuffs, but whatever. Uh, I had to do that with some of my girlfriends. No, um, <laughs> don't tell my wife. Uh, no, but um, anyway. Okay, so. What do we do? Oh, by the way, these are cool too. This is, uh, you can use these. I like using these because these are a little bit, um, you know, they're just as thin. They're smaller, so they can be easier to work with. What you're doing is you're trying to introduce space between a door lock to push a tongue in. Um, or if you're trying to get past a mag lock, you can use this. If you can get about a tenth of an inch, which is about this as well, of space between a magnet, the two magnets, by forcing this up into it, uh, you can defeat a magnetically locked door. Um, there's another way too, uh, an electromagnetic pulse. <laughs> I tried that this last week. I built my own. I like burn myself with a solder gun because I suck. But, um, and, and it kind of worked. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about that a little bit here. Uh, but anyway, these are just shims. Uh, they work pretty well. And you know, what do we do with all this once we get in? Well, we put in neat little devices. Oh, and this is handy, by the way. I don't have my GoPro in it, but um, it's really nice to stick around a corner and check to see if there's you know, any cameras. Because most of the time, cameras in the little areas that I'm breaking into are set for what? Motion detection, all right? So they're set for motion detection, usually for somebody who's like right in the middle of the stairway area, but not right up against the wall. So you can stick this and not really have any problem uh, and you can see if there's a camera there. If there's a camera there, then you've got two options. Uh, like run real fast because it might be set to such a low um, amount of you know, frames per second that it won't see you. Like you'll like appear suddenly and disappear and they'll be like, oh my God, what happened to him? Uh, or uh, you can shine one of these at the camera. <laughs> Did that work? Yeah. Uh, if you shine this at the camera, what happens is exactly that. It blots it out. All right, because the camera iris is looking for the light, and it's going to lose everything else around it. So you can just literally walk past the camera like this, and they won't be able to see you. Now, it's not going to work too well if somebody's monitoring it live, right? It's just going to help you not get prosecuted afterwards. If somebody's watching it live, they're probably going to pick that up and see you. Again, monitoring controls, very, very important, because there was your chance to stop somebody. We'll take a look at it. There's a couple of others here, too. I love the little hook deal. Um, I had a buddy who had that. We used it. It works beautifully. Uh, it's really neat. You slide it over the back of the door. You can put the tension on it. It comes on up and it comes on over the. It just it's wonderful. You just pull and pulls down. Doesn't work if they got mounted the wrong way. You'd be surprised the number of doors I've seen that have been like installed wrong <laughs> that actually saved them in the long run. <laughs> but we'll look at those here in a minute. Um, Oh, one of my favorite tools. Okay, this bar down here. All right, 
So these are bypasses. That's my EMP up there, by the way. Uh, it's an electro electromagnetic pulse generator. I, I built it. If, if anybody can kind of tell, these are all parts off of a uh, throwaway camera. Just go by throwaway camera. All you want is the capacitor off of the flash, right? By the way, um, discharge the capacitor <laughs> before you first start doing it because it, it hurt a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, otherwise it, it works pretty well. You can need a little power source, but what that does is it disables the um, electrical component in the magnetic door that allows those magnets to go ahead and seal. So once you disable that and electricity doesn't flow to it anymore, um, you're able to get in right away. You'll hear a little click and you can open up the door and get in. Um, but uh, this is my favorite because same kind of door, uh, you'll have the push bar doors, right? And those push bar doors will always have to allow egress. Um, that's really an important thing to remember is that uh, because of fire code and law, um, you have to allow people to be able to get out, all right? Uh, in c unless you're a psych ward and, and a prison. Don't, you know, I, I know this, so just, you know, take my word on that one. Um, the, uh, so by fire code, there's two things that they'll do. There'll either be a motion detector right above the door that looks down that as you come close to the door, it registers you and then it unlocks, allows you to go, right? Uh, or it has some sort of a, um, there's a small in current going through the push, uh, the, the push bar that when you touch it, it knows, okay, there's a human here, it completes the circuit, and then it allows it to unlock, and you can go out. So for defeating those motion detector doors, this is one of my favorite tools. This is just poster board. You can buy it at uh, Walgreens or whatever. Most of the time, you'll notice doors like that one over there, or this one over here, there's a big gap underneath it, right? There's a motion detector right on the other side. Just kick that puppy right underneath. It's going to trigger the motion detector. You'll walk right in. Every single time. <laughs> I'd love to have said, oh, there's this really high-tech way to do it. I was going to do that, but I was like, nah, I'm going to go get it. The other thing you can do is um, you can take a stick, like a yard stick or something, uh, and take a portion of this and stick it through the door. Because if it's a double door, they normally don't have the center piece. Because the reason it's a double door is they're trying to get large amounts of stuff through there and they need to be able to open it and they don't want to continuously have to remove that center piece, so they just leave it out. Well, the problem is you can stick something like that through and also wave it vigorously and it will also open up the door. Works really good for glass doors too there that way. So I'm telling you all this stuff, you have to like promise me you don't break into this place <laughs> at night because I already noticed a few things. But um, Okay, this other stick thing though, if it's not a motion detector one, you just stick this underneath the door. It slides right underneath. You turn it upwards. This top part right here um, goes up against the bar. This bottom piece you hold on to because it's metal. You conduct. It conducts. It senses, ah, human, and just pull. And it will unlock the door, and you can walk right in. All right? If you're ever stuck, this is good stuff to know. You can just carry this around in your bag. All right, these are really cool things, but I don't have any of them. This is an old KGB deal that you could set and it would get through any lock. Um, and this other one was an electronic version uh, that allowed you to sit there and pull the various different pins the way you needed them to go. I just thought they were cool, so I put them in here because they're on my wish list. If anybody wants to buy me a Christmas present, I would very much like to have one of these. Um, this is some, high, some, some ways to you also get past some of the monitoring. This is one of my favorites. Just get a balloon. And then watch. You know, do this on an outside camera and watch. Okay? The reason, you, why, why do you want to watch? Yeah. See if anybody comes out. Then you know, are they watching the camera or are they just recording? You know, because they might just be recording it. You know? Uh, but same kind of thing. Uh, so equate that to, um, you know, computer intrusion. Create some noise. See what happens. You know? And uh, normally they won't because they don't want to get caught. But. And then, of course, the flashlight. That's a great example of the flashlight in work. Um, this poor guy over here, he's going to get caught. But the guy who's got the flashlight, completely blotted out. 
I had to do that this last week. The flashlight one. Oops. Yeah, that one up there. All right. But try not to do this because you make too much noise. And you also damage the door, which you'll have to pay out of whatever contract money that they're paying you to do it. It's fun, guaranteed, you know, destroying stuff, but you don't want to do that. All right, so the stories. Uh, I don't have any photos for this one, but this was a very large regional medical facility. The objective, like you'll see all of these, was to break into it after hours and to see what I could do, all right? Uh, what we did is we cased out the facility and we noticed that uh, the medical offices next to the hospital uh, were left open past 9 p.m., all right? And one of the reasons is that they had clinics. But not all the clinics were open, so some clinics weren't, and they didn't have any of those guards that come down over their reception area, you know, like the you know, pull-down lock uh, screens. They didn't have any of their doors that they could lock to their area. They had to be open. So what we did is we went in there and we jumped over um, that that front desk. Uh, we got a bunch of medical records that hadn't been put away and filed. Uh, the back room wasn't locked, probably should have been, but wasn't. We got into a physician's office, stole his uh, coat, stole his ID badges uh, and his laptop uh, and his stethoscope because that completed the whole look. Uh, and then walked over to the hospital where the sheriff's deputies let us right in the door. Um, which they shouldn't have after hours. They should have been asking you who you're here to see, that kind of thing, or they could have checked my credentials. If they did, they would have seen that I didn't look like the guy on the ID badge that I was carrying around, uh, other than I had his jacket on, <laughs> his coat. Uh, we got in, we were able to go throughout the hospital, got into medical records. Uh, we got into, um, interestingly enough, the um, uh, imaging area, medical imaging. All right, so that's where all of your x-rays, ultrasounds, all that stuff. Uh, the guy had ordered, uh, the, the administrator, system administrator, had, had, had stated that he didn't need to lock his computer because his area was always locked down. Nobody could get into it. And sure enough, when we got to his area, uh, he had one of those accordion walls, you know, that you can close and lock, and it kind of shuts the whole area off. But unfortunately, he had mounted it on the wrong side, so we had access to the screws and he had a screw gun sitting right there. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, it worked out pretty well, you know? We were able to take it, zh, 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 took it right out, walked in, and he wasn't locked up, and we were able to access uh, all kinds of, you know, interesting photos and medical records. Uh, plus, his back door actually gave access right into medical records, so we were able to walk through there. Probably, um, besides getting into the psych ward and getting into the emergency department and ICU and surgery, um, the most, um, the scariest thing that they experienced was the fact that I got into pharmacy, all right? Now, pharmacy, nobody should be able to get into, period, except for the pharmacist. Even a doctor can't get in there. And they don't dispense anymore. You know, they count out the pills and they put them in machines that will then dispense them, dis you know, on, you know, whoever it is that's accessing it or who's ever requested it, the pharmacist allows it. It's just a better way to account for these things. So late at night, pharmacists are probably doing what? Well, they're counting. They're counting out pills, you know, uh, and what they're going to go and then, you know, put into these dispensaries. Uh, well, they had, you know, they had this door, and the door had biometrics. It had a code that you had to put in, and it had a badge reader uh, and some sort of key on it. I'm not sure which one of those were active or not, right? But it didn't matter because they had a window because it used to be a dispensing pharmacy, like most of them were. Uh, and the window wasn't just that it was there, it was open. <laughs> I mean, not even just unlocked, but I mean open. So I was able to put my arm around and open up the door. And that's how I got into pharmacy. Uh, the pharmacist didn't know I had come in because they were around the corner in the back with their earbuds in and they were counting out pills, you know. Interestingly enough, the fastest way to fix that, and I told them, all right, I said, put in a strobe. Anytime the door opens, strobe lights go off. No matter who it is that's in the pharmacy, no matter what it is that they're doing, they're going to know that somebody came in. There's only a limited number of folks that come in. And if they don't want to question why they did, they should immediately inform security. Because they didn't question me, they should have, because I walked around the back. Because at this point, it was like, gee, I'm just going to go till somebody actually catches me <laughs> and does the right thing, you know? <laughs> So I went around the back, and they kind of looked at me like, wow, that's really weird. And I'm going to go back to, you know. 
I don't know what they were listening to. It sounded pretty good, though. And, uh, and that was that. I finally did get stopped in this particular test uh, up on the maternity ward by a charge nurse. Charge nurses are great because they're mean, right? <laughs> they don't care what the hell you're there for. They're going to, you know. So she came right up, and she said, I'm sorry, but why are you wearing Joe's badge? You're not Joe. And I looked down, and I said, you know, you're the first person to ask that very good question in five hours. I took down her name because she went into the report. She still wasn't convinced. She thought I was still trying to get her, you know. <laughs> well, you know what? You guys are good. I'm just here doing this test. You know, no, no. I said, and finally, I said, you know, go ahead. Get a hold of the deputies. They can come up. No, because I rarely get caught. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Have I ever been approached in a violent way uh, by some uh, for intruding? And the answer is, is no. Uh, I rarely ever get caught. Um, in this particular instance, you usually I also have a letter uh, indicating, um, you know, why I'm there, uh, along with contact info. And in the event that law enforcement were to show up or security were to show up, you just get arrested. You just go ahead, let them detain you because it'll all get cleared out anyway, because it's already in, con we have it in contract that they're not going to press charges, <laughs> but it's a good question, and you, you definitely, when you're doing these kinds of tests, you have to do that. All right. Defense industry, R&D. Do we have a class? Yes, yes. Oh, all right. Well, I guess that's it, folks. Sorry I didn't make it through all the stories. Um, here's just some interesting ways to get in with a screwdriver. Never give anybody access to a lock, ever, a locking mechanism especially. You know, put a bar over it. Don't ever do what they did here and keep your keys right there. <laughs> yeah. Or with the desk <laughs> labeled. And then have your access cards right there along with all the keys. That's one of the doors. There's a, there's a mechanism on the top. Good lock, badly installed because I was able to literally unscrew it. And that's what I found. Unlocked C CFO computer and passwords. <laughs> Evil donkeys ate them all. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, at least I went through them all. <laughs> so walking around the place for five hours, what kind of information did you get? A bad